Hey, everyone. Um, so Ryan is a software developer from Australia, in Melbourne, Melbourne Australia. Um, he's been programming for 10 years, and despite frequently going off into other languages, um, he's always returned to Python for its unique combination of, I have to keep looking at the thing, expressiveness, readability, and strong sense of community. That's you guys. He loves you all. <laughs> Um, he's taking a break from building high-performance web APIs for Mozilla to tell us all about PyPy.js. And Brian? Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for coming out. Uh, this is me if you need to get in touch with me afterwards. And uh, as you heard, I uh, currently work for Mozilla, which is really great. It's a pretty fantastic place to work. Uh, but it also means that I'm kind of confronted on an almost daily basis by this feeling of unease that there's something like not quite right with the state of the world. And I think maybe some of you have felt this way as well, so I want to tell you a bit about it and, and get your thoughts. If, if you've heard of Mozilla, uh, it's probably because we make a pretty fantastic web browser called Firefox. Um, but Mozilla as a company and as a worldwide community is about a lot more than just, hey, let's make this really awesome web browser. Um, Mozilla at its core, the mission is really about protecting and promoting the web. Right? It's about the web as a shared global technological resource, as a platform for innovation and opportunity and uh, individual empowerment. Um, the problem is, like, you say, oh, the web, um, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, depending on who they are and, and the context you're using it in. Right? So on the one hand, you say the web, and you might mean the technology stack, right? HTML, CSS, the funny little language called JavaScript in there. Um, but the web is also kind of a collection of, of cultural and techno-social kind of properties that have emerged around these technologies that are really interesting and kind of unique to the web, right? So a big one uh, for the web is its openness, and it's something we talk about a lot. You know, if you want to publish something on the web, you don't uh, submit it to the web store and then sit around waiting for your approval from Webpool, and then they tell you that you violated section 17.1c of the web's terms of service and you can't publish your thing anymore. Right? You just put it out there and, and uh, let people go and get it. The jewel of that, of course, is that people who want to use your stuff, they don't have to be locked into a particular platform or a particular vendor. Um, so it has this great combination of openness and ubiquity uh, that makes it a fantastic platform for distributing ideas. Um, despite the web's kind of reputation as a bit of a wild west badlands, uh, the last two points under culture there are not jokes. Um, the whole job of a web browser, right, is to go and fetch probably badly written code from a site that it's never seen before and execute it locally on your machine uh, in a way that means you know, you, you're not going to get hacked, uh, but you're also not going to leak your personal details or your browsing history or things like that to whatever sites you're visiting. So the web has this kind of security and trust issues built into it in a fundamental way. The problem, though, um, is that for a lot of people, I may as well have labelled these columns thusly. Right? <laughs> there are people who, who will look at the technology stack of the web and just go, ah, like, will this thing please hurry up and die? I want to replace it with something better. Um, I'm not entirely in that camp myself, but I certainly have days where I can sympathize with that, that feeling. Um, the problem is, you know, if, if people leave the web for other platforms because of the tech stack, then we start to lose all of these wonderful properties uh, that are part of the, you know, the socio-technical cultural stuff of the web. Um, and if too many people leave, then we may not, you know, we may lose these things entirely. It might take us 30 years to get them back. So for all its flaws, I feel like, you know, the web is, is really wonderful and it's worth keeping. And as an engineer, then, it means that the web is worth improving. So I really like the way that uh, our CTO, Andreas, puts this. He said, for, for people at Mozilla, anything that the web can't do or isn't faster and better at than native technologies is a bug. People should have no excuses not to be using the web as their platform. And it's funny because, uh, like maybe some of you, I have noticed actually one of these things that's a bit of a bug in the web. Um, I want to write in Python. <laughs> and it's kind of hard to do that on the web right now. Uh, so, so this talk is, is basically me exploring the space of like, you know, what if we actually consider this? Yes, we should be able to write in Python on the web. What exactly does that mean and what might it look like? Um, so it's a project called PyPyJS. Uh, and I want to basically tell you a little bit about the what, the how, and the why. Uh, the first question is what, and in a sense that's pretty trivial, right? It's, uh, it's a Python environment on the web. So I'm using Firefox for my slides here. And uh, here's Python on the web. Look, I can print uh, hello web. And it does Python-y stuff. Ta-da! Um, who's seen something like this before? 
Right, you know, there are uh, a lot of projects out there trying to approach this problem in a variety of different ways, making a, a different set of trade-offs. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about kind of where I want this particular one to go. Um, and the first thing to, uh, to note is that this is an experiment. <laughs> I'm not here to sell you on this as a technology that you should take home and use today. I'm here to kind of report on an idea and some preliminary results and, and probably a few reasons why you shouldn't take it home and use it today. But we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. So the first thing I'm, I'm really interested in is compliance, right? Um, so some of the Python on the web environments that exist will kind of look like Python but aren't, and they have things like if you did this in some of them, you would get a, a JavaScript number back that had been truncated into a double because in order to be fast, they compile down to JavaScript number model. You know, but we have big nums by default because we're in Python. Um, we also have fun things like globals. Oop, globals. Um, that you can mutate your state, like we have fun things like uh, sys.getFrame and all these sort of like bits and pieces of Python that you know I do not use every day, but they are part of what makes Python what it is. Yeah. The second thing I'm really interested in is being fast, and not necessarily like Fortran number crunching fast, right? But fast enough that the speed of the platform is not a problem. Um, you know, the fellow named uh, Alan Turing kind of proved that in principle it would be possible to put Python on the web, um, but to do it in a way that uh, <laughs> that is kind of fast enough for daily use is is a, is a whole other challenge. So I've been, you know, as a starting point, I've been experimenting with this little thing called PyStone. Uh, which ships by default with Python. It's a benchmark, so it's meaningless, right? But it's a thing that you have, you can run, it tells you how fast it goes. Uh, and this is the native C Python on my platform. If we run it like so, it gets about 80,000 uh, Pythons a second pretty reliably, which is pretty good. Um, if I take this over to the web and do the same thing, uh, it'll clock in at about half that, about 40,000. Which for something running inside a web browser is pretty good, like half the speed of the native Python. Um, I'm playing a little trick here though because my Python has a just-in-time compiler in it and what I've just done is primed that up. So if I run it again, uh, it'll come in at nearly 160,000 Pythons a second, which is substantially faster than the C Python on my machine. Um, which, is, which is not bad for something running inside a web browser. And it's, uh, it's actually quite interesting to see um, how the performance compares across these different platforms. So here's a graph with uh, the two things you just saw. Um, so that's CPython running this benchmark and then this thing running inside Firefox. You can see Firefox version kind of starts off pretty slow but ramps up really quickly once it's just in time compiler kicks in. If I run the same test in Chrome, it actually starts off even slower um, because Firefox has some, some special case handling for the sort of JavaScript I'm using here. Um, but the steady state performance, once it figures out what it wants to do, is actually much higher. Um, so it's interesting sort of to, to uh, find that result as a, as a Mozilla employee. Naturally, I had to go and find a, file a bug in Firefox and try and get it fixed. So if you get my patch from Bugzilla, Firefox's performance <laughs> looks like that. Um, it's, it's, it's not quite ready to land. It turns out that hacking on a JavaScript engine is kind of tricky. Uh, but I hope to sort of shepherd that through. Um, there's, no, there's no magic here, right? If I take the PyPy Python interpreter and I run it natively, the graph looks like this. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be faster. It's running natively. But it's interesting that we're not, like, embarrassingly, like, we're not on the, on the x-axis, right? We're sort of, we're on the graph. Um, and I think there's scope for some of the technologies that I'll talk about in this talk to really close that gap even further. So, you know, the, the speed aspect, you know, is, is kind of interesting and it's maybe something we can do a good job of. Uh, the third thing that uh, is really interesting to me is being basically a good web citizen. Um, I don't really care about having a Python console on the web, and I want Python to be of the web, you know, in a, in a very fundamental way. So on the one hand, that means providing uh, an in-browser API that a JavaScript environment can use to talk to Python. So we have uh, an object that you can create that will give you a, a PyPy VM. Um, it gives you a promise that you can get notified uh, when it's ready. If you haven't seen this dot then, this is like all the rage in, in JavaScript now for doing um, asynchronous callbacks in a, in a sort of semi-sensible fashion. Um, and you have this API that you can, I'll, I'll set some variables in my Python interpreter, I'll, I'll evaluate some code, I'll get the variables back out. Um, which is a very coarse API, but it's enough to bootstrap you into Python, where you should then go and do all your interesting stuff in Python, like this. Uh, so my little Python console here has a module called JS. 
uh, and from it I can do the backwards equivalent of that other slide, like take a JavaScript expression and evaluate it, and I'll get a handle back to a, a JavaScript number, which as I mentioned are not the same as Python numbers, they're doubles. Um, but they can be made to interact with Python numbers in a sensible fashion because we have magic dunder methods and so forth, right? Um, but we also have access to all of the objects in our JavaScript environment. So we have fun things like alert. Ta-da! <laughs> Um, my, my front end web dev wizardry is on display in this talk. Um, but we can also get at stuff like jQuery, which I'm using for some of my slides. Um, and I can do fun things like find this console window. There it is. And set like the background color to something bold like magenta. Magenta! Um, <laughs> I need that. If, if we wanted to get really fancy, we could actually define like a callback and return a hexadecimal color value that we select in a cryptographically secure random fashion. <laughs> ah, no. <laughs> the one disadvantage of doing this is I can't pre-record all of my demos. Stop it. There we go. Um, so I can pass that as a callback into JavaScript um, and have jQuery callback into Python to work its dubious magic on my color scheme. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of fun, right? You can get a bit of a two-way bridge going. Um, there are a few rough edges here, like it turns out that doing a cross-language bridge is kind of difficult. Uh, collecting garbage across a language barrier is a, like a, an unsolved problem. Um, but it's amazing how well a lot of the stuff that you do on the web kind of can actually fit in Python, just reflecting JavaScript objects and giving you, you know, exposing them to you as, as part of Python. So let me make sure I don't have that sticking around. Um, so summing up, what I'm trying to do here is experiment with building a fast and compliant in-browser Python environment. Right? And I haven't seen kind of any compelling solutions to that problem that really ticks all three of those boxes. Um, you know, if, if you want something that looks like Python but runs really fast in the browser, um, you can get projects that will map Python syntax onto something a lot closer to JavaScript semantics. If you want um, something that's a lot closer to standard Python, um, you can get something like Brython, which by the way I think is an awesome project, um, but they pay for that compatibility in terms of performance. Um, so I want to see, you know, if some new technologies that are coming out in, in Python and in JavaScript, and maybe we can tick all three of these boxes. But I do keep saying the word experiment for a reason. Um, so there are some buts here. And the first part is that it's not always so fast. So remember what I said about benchmarks. I'm going to give you an alternative benchmark that may be more representative of the performance of your code, uh, depending on, you know, what it is you're doing, which is just uh, summing up a bunch of numbers which CPython can handle uh, almost instantaneously. So if I bring it over here to the web, you might think based on the other one, well, that's really not going to be uh, any difficulty whatsoever. Um, sadly, you'd be wrong. You'd be really, like, really wrong. <laughs> Sometimes your um, this script is unresponsive wrong. <laughs> um, Basically, what's going on here is a terrible, terrible interaction between the uh, clever just-in-time compiler stuff in my Python shell and the just-in-time compiler stuff inside Firefox. And so that bug fix I mentioned earlier actually makes this a lot better. Um, but there are currently some kind of pretty pathological performance problems that I'm fairly confident we can get around, but you know they are definitely still there. The other problem is that it's humongous, right? These are the files that you need to download to run this thing in your browser. And I don't know about, about your feelings on the subject, but when you're downloading megabytes of JavaScript to do something, you're probably going to have a bad time, just in general on the internet. Um, that said, this slide is slightly out of date. This is a slide I used in uh, PyCon AU about a month ago. My current dev build is closer to this. Um, so, you know, it's still huge, but we're also still picking low-hanging fruit here. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where that bottoms out. Now what's really interesting to me uh, from a technical standpoint is the how. Right? And this project is really a combination of two really interesting technologies that exist. One in the Python world, one in the JavaScript world. Um, that I saw and fell in love with and wanted to smush together. And happily they smushed together really well. The first is PyPy. Um, who knows about PyPy? 
pipeline. Sort of, you know, it's 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 got a bit of mind share. Um, it's uh, an alternative Python interpreter with two really interesting properties. The first is that it is written in Python. So a Python interpreter written in Python, which means it's really fun to hack on. Um, I would say an order of magnitude easier to dive in and hack on than an equivalent interpreter written in C. The second interesting property is that despite being written in Python, it is astonishingly fast. Um, by two pretty magical feats of, of engineering genius. Um, one trick that they use is that it's, it's kind of written in Python. It's written in this restricted subset uh, that they call R Python, which if you squint and if you try really hard and if you're a crazy super genius compiler engineer, um, you can take this restricted subset of Python and you can translate it into C. So you get like a native executable. Um, the second trick that they have is that they built a just-in-time compiler generator because they're crazy you know, compiler super geniuses and building just-in-time compiler would be a walk in the park. Um, so when you have an interpreter written in Python, what they can do is like look inside that automatically and like take a few hints that you might have put in there and then generate a just-in-time compiler out of it to speed up the operation of that interpreter magically, you know, automatically, uh, which is pretty amazing. So the, the process of using PyPy from, from start to finish looks something like this, right? You start with a Python interpreter written in Python. You run it through this translation process to get a bunch of C files. And you compile those down to native code, which you can run and stuff a Python script into. It will execute that Python script and it will trace it, it will figure out what are the hot paths through the code and stuff like that. And it will generate specialized native code at runtime based on the code that you've given it. And so you kind of wind up running this native approximation of your code because of the just-in-time compiler. And that's what lets it run really fast. Um, the second project I'm interested in is Emscripten. Um, and Emscripten is a backend for the LLVM compiler toolchain. Um, and like any compiler backend, it, you know, it takes some intermediate form and it emits um, assembly language. It doesn't emit x86 or ARM or something like that. The trick with Emscripten is that it emits JavaScript. So you can take something like C or C++ or a, a front-end language that's supported by LLVM. You can translate it through this toolchain and spit out JavaScript and run that in your browser. Um, the guy who, who's behind this, who is again a, a sort of crazy compiler super genius, um, basically started it because he wanted to port a game to the web. So I, I have this, this code base, it's a game, it's in C++, I'd really like to run that on the web, I think I'll go and write a C++ to JavaScript compiler. Um, <laughs> which, when, <laughs> when, when you're Alonzo Kai, actually works out really well. Um, so it's, it's not just a compiler, it's also like a simulated POSIX file system environment and get time and like dev null and dev u random and all of this stuff that means um, that you can basically treat the web as a cross-compiler target. Right? So you can start with something written in C, you can run it through a compiler that, that operates in the same way as GCC, and you spit out JavaScript. You take that JavaScript and you put it in your web browser and modern web browsers have very sophisticated just-in-time compilers in them. So they will run that JavaScript and they'll figure out what paths are hot and so on and so forth and they'll convert that into this native approximation of, of your code. So you kind of wind up with where you wanted to get to originally but you're indirecting via JavaScript in the browser and you're getting kind of all that good stuff from, from the web as a platform with openness and, and, and the reach of the platform which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, it's kind of astonishing that this can work. Like people don't think of JavaScript as a low-level assembly language. We think of it as a as a object-oriented something or other, right? It's got strings and objects and functions and all this fun stuff. Um, but it turns out that in, in the process of building this, they kind of discovered that if you really like, if you ignore ninety percent of JavaScript and you just look at oh, it's it's got IEEE like standard doubles and it's got bitwise operators um, and it's got a few tricks that mean you can do things like take closures and address byte arrays and things like this. Uh, and you ignore all the rest of it, what you basically have is a virtual 32-bit CPU hidden inside JavaScript. And if you just target that, it turns out that modern JavaScript engines can run that stuff really fast. Um, I put up an, an example of the sort of uh, JavaScript that it generates, not because I expect you to really read it, but just to show you it doesn't look anything like something you'd write by hand. Um, but it's full of these tricks, right? It, it, it takes a reference to math.square root, and because of the semantics of JavaScript, we're taking that inside a closure, the, the engine can prove that that's a constant which is something you can't do in Python, nothing's ever constant. Um, you know, it, it can prove that we're reading from a, an array of floats so it knows it's dealing with doubles and kind of all of these tricks to, to make JavaScript run really fast at the expense of being awful. Um, so I had this idea, 
I said these, these are two projects that will fit really well together. Here's what we'll do. We'll take a Python interpreter written in Python. We'll run it through this translation tool chain to get a bunch of C files. We'll compile those C files into JavaScript with them scripting, and we'll give them to the browser, which will JIT compile them into native code into which I will stuff my Python. Now, because I started from an interpreter written in Python, it's actually not a big deal to dive in there and retarget its JIT compiler to emit asm.js at runtime from my code, which the browser will, of course, JIT compile back into an approximate, you know, a native approximation um, of the code I wanted to run in the first place. So I get to the place I wanted to be, just going through a few extra layers of indirection, um, which, is, which is pretty great. Whose impression upon seeing this diagram is something like, that is awful? <laughs> it's okay, put your hands up if you feel like it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, I agree. <laughs> it's some sort of word starting with AW. Um, <laughs> It's, you know, it's a collection of, of backwards compatibility hacks and, and, and kind of weird layering violations, but we get to use the reach of the web. I just want to point out, though, that this quote-unquote native code that it's generating at the end here, when that hits the CPU, the CPU is going to translate that into its actual native code in, you know, representation internally. Um, and it's going to do all sorts of crazy tricks, like uh, try to guess which branches your code will take and speculatively execute them before you even ask it to. Uh, it'll rearrange your instructions and do them out of order and then give you the results back so it looks like it actually did what you asked for. Um, so when you put that in the diagram, kind of, I don't feel too bad about all the other stuff I'm doing on top. Um, because the whole platform on which we're building modern computing, it's exactly this kind of awful all the way down, right? Um, but it's useful. So that, that really brings me to the third point, which is why. Which maybe some of you are wondering quietly to yourselves. Um, my thoughts on the matter are summed up by, by this uh, Saturday morning breakfast cereal cartoon. And this is how people expect you to respond when they ask you why. They expect you to go into this advocacy mode and, oh, why is this important? Well, it has very interesting applications for energy, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, this is me, except I had the sense of the, you can fill in the blanks there, but, you know, why, why are you doing this? Because I think it's awesome, it's fun, and I want to play around with all of this cool stuff. Um, that said, maybe it can actually be useful. Like, I think being able to use Python in the browser could, could be a useful thing. And, you know, when people see it, they, they immediately want to think, oh, I want to do this, right? Script type text equals Python, no more JavaScript. I just want to reiterate something I said briefly earlier on in the talk, right? If your users have to download 15 meg of JavaScript to see the like blinking buttons or something on your website, they're probably going to have a bad time. I'll also point out that you didn't have to uh, sit around waiting for me to view, uh, load up these slides. And if I could work my computer, I'd show you. Um, so because you didn't have to be, have that load time in your hot path, I actually did go ahead and implement some logic for these slides as a script type text equals Python tag. So totally doable, just takes a really long time to start up. Um, if you want to do that today, maybe you should consider some of these alternative projects that take a different set of trade-offs, um, but are probably going to give you a better result in your startup time. Um, but, you know, I'm kind of interested in, in hearing from people if, if, you know, they have some ideas of, of how this can be used. Like, maybe we can take the idea of Py2exe and turn it into Py2web, right? We take a Python application, bundle it up with all of its dependencies, dump a bunch of JavaScript files and put it on the web and let people get at it, you know, kind of for free. Um, put an application manifest on it and turn it into Firefox OS application and, like, extend your reach into some non-zero percentage of the global smartphone market. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, convert that into an Android application using a, another cool project that Mozilla is working on and get a few more percent of the global smartphone market. Sort of extend the reach of your Python applications for free by using this, this technology. Um, you know, the, the scientific community is doing some great stuff on the web with, with IPython and maybe we can, we can provide even more of an in-browser experience there. Um, also, I'm kind of just interested in getting stuff for free. Like maybe, uh, so the PyPy guys are building a PHP interpreter as like a, as a, uh, a money raiser. So maybe we can run PHP on the web and get like cool stuff like that for free from this technology stack. Um, but mostly what I, what I want to encourage people to do is to try and adopt this approach of, of um, filing bugs against the web. Like don't settle for the web as like a second class platform that's good for some things and not for others. There are, you know, a, a lot of really great technologies coming out all across the space, that means we can do interesting things. So literally, you know, if, if the web can't do something that you think it should be able to do, like, hey, run Python, um, consider that a bug and, you know, maybe file it on, on bugzilla.mozilla.org and see how you go, try your luck, I guess. But 
you know, adopt this mindset of yes, the platform should be able to support all of these interesting things outside of its, you know, its usual uh, skill set. So. Uh, I want to leave some time for questions, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, these are my details. You can grab uh, the source and uh, the slides for this talk from here. Otherwise, there's been a lot of fun to work on and talk about, so thank you very much. First question. Hi. Uh, given that you're working at Mozilla and we want to avoid downloading two megs of JavaScript every time we hit this, what's the possibility that we could get this built into the browser? Um, it's funny, actually. I think the first, the first or second question when I presented at PyCon IU was, was almost exactly the same. Um, I haven't spoken to anyone about it. Um, I, I, I don't see why that wouldn't work. Um, I don't see a lot of value in shipping that um, to 20 percent of the browser market, you know, if, if, we were, if we could convince Chrome to ship it and we get sort of 50 percent plus penetration and then people can start using it, um, that'll be awesome. If we can get the size down a bit, like maybe what it means is people can start to ship Python with kind of extra features turned on or a smoother experience and fall back to, to this as a default implementation. Um, so I, I, I feel like you're probably on the right track, but it's an interesting strategy question to see how to, how to try to build up to that point without trying to reach too far as a single platform vendor um, and get something that nobody's going to support because it's not on the rest of the web. Keep your hand up, please, so I can see you. So you just said uh, it doesn't make sense to ship it uh, with the browser. But I'm just wondering, maybe there are some specific uh, usages, like, for example, just building a test environment on that? Yeah. Because uh, what you showed, like, just with, with the console, it could be, in my opinion, quite, quite in interesting, for example, extension to, uh, mm, mm, to Firebug. Yeah, Just yeah. to have this kind of console um, and view. And, you know, so, I mean, you say extension, but maybe shipping this as an add-on is, is a different approach as well, right, for people who want to get at some of this stuff. Um, absolutely. So it's, it's sort of funny to, to come and talk about the web and has this great properties as a distribution platform and then kind of say, well, actually, I, you know, the story of how you would distribute this is far from obvious because it's so big. Uh, interesting, interesting challenge. I'm not sure how feasible it would be, but I mean, if you think in, in theory, you've got your print hello web statement, uh, you don't need a lot of the machinery of, of Python uh, and its standard libraries yep. to, to, to do that. And um, it seems in theory at least, you should be able to know at uh, build time what you need and what you don't. And you should be able to uh, produce a minimal uh, set of functionality Absolutely. and Absolutely. deliver it. So I mean, in theory, it seems that you should be able to ship a much, much smaller subset of that. Um, so if I take out most of the built-in modules, the size of that comes down to uh, un probably under 10 from memory. If I take out the just-in-time compiler, so that you get Python, and it's not as fast, but it's still Python, it comes in at about 5 meg. So there are lots of things you can kind of pair away to try and, and get just the experience that you want. Part of the problem is that building PyPy from source takes a couple of hours, um, and you can't just chop bits out, like you've got to switch it off in the config and then start again. Um, but definitely, and you know, you could also rip them out post-compilation, right? So you could take the generated JavaScript and then say, oh, actually, I don't need that, I don't need that, and pull them out at that level, which is kind of trickier to do in assembly, but perfectly fine in JavaScript. Um, is it working with Node.js? You can run this stuff under Node.js. So you can just import it and do um, Python in Node. I, 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 one of the things I wanted to do before this was put it up on NPM, but I didn't get around to it. I was too busy trying to get down to 14 meg. Uh, but yeah, totally, I, I will publish this to NPM, like NPM install PyPy uh, and load it up. And then run, run like WSGI apps under Node for awesome web scale. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's possible to use um, PyPy.js to pre-compile your Python into JavaScript, um, or is that something that uh, some of these other tools Yeah, so that's, do? that's the approach taken by uh, something like Python.js, for example. And the, the problem is um, 
the, the semantics of JavaScript and Python are really different. Um, like they look, same, look the same at a high level. Um, you know, they both have kind of dicts and, and numbers and stuff, but there's all these little incompatibilities that make, you know, you, you could probably take 80% of, of Python code and just translate it directly to idiomatic JavaScript and it would run fine. Um, but the other 20% are fiendishly difficult to do. Um, so that's, that's an explicit non-goal of this project. Um, and so like, like PyJS, uh, PythonJS, there are a couple of other projects that do a, a really good job of that. And like that is, a, that is an excellent trade-off to make. You know, if you want to ship JavaScript, you just ship the stuff you need. You don't ship a VM. Um, it's just sort of, I don't want to say it's a solved problem. It's a problem that very capable people are working on um, that doesn't particularly interest me. So yeah, not, not exactly a strong suit for this one. Hi. Um, I believe Microsoft uh, at one point experimented with putting .NET into uh, IE so you could do any .NET yeah. language, which would have included Iron Python. And it seems like they pulled back from that partly because um, programmers know how to write asynchronous JavaScript, but they don't know how to write that in any other language. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, your yeah, thoughts. sorry, finish your question, but I have a... Uh, Just your thoughts on that. Sorry. Um, so one of the things that PyPy has is a transparent uh, stackless transform, right? which I don't have working yet, but the idea is that you can, um, you know, you can uh, run this translation pass that turns your threads into micro-threads, and then you get uh, green threading by default, like a kind of transparent G event, uh, I guess. So if you get that working in, in uh, PyPyJS, then you can kind of write um, synchronous style Python and have it asynchronified semi-automatically. Uh, so I, I think that would be really interesting, like terrifically challenging to get working, but technically very possible and interesting way to go. Fortunately, we're out of time for questions, so uh, thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you.